Yeah, man. Marikan Holocaust. Shout out to my code keepers. All my consistent cons, man. You being consistent, man. You keeping the water flowing. Hey, I'm talking my cons stepping up. You know what I'm saying? For the fourth wave. Just knowing how important it is for your presence to be felt, to push the line of the frequency. To be a strong wall of protection, Ahab, to the dragon sponsors, the dragons on the wall, the copper dragon, silver dragon, gold, that keep the water flowing consistently. And let's pop off back in American Holocaust by David Stannard. Let's belly flop on page 25 of the book. The full PDF is in the drop library. Lego. Among the numerous outstanding examples of Southwest agricultural achievement are the Kokoan Ko Ko communities. They spell it C-H-C-O-A-N, Kokoan communities of San Juan Basin in Colorado, a how to the Temple. Colorado and New Mexico within the Anasazi culture area. Ahab to the Hakan. Higher man, the Anasazi drop will never be forgotten. Chaco Canyon, Canyon, is near the middle of the San Juan Basin. And here, more than a thousand years ago, there existed the Metropolitan Hub of hundreds of villages and at least nine large towns constructed around enormous multi-story building complexes. Pueblo Bonito is an example of one of these, a single four-story building with large high-ceilinged rooms and balconies. It contained 800 rooms, including private residences. For more than 12 hundred people and dozens of circular common rooms up to 60 feet in diameter. No single structure in what later became the United States housed this many people into the largest apartment buildings in New York City were constructed in the 19th century. But in its time, Pueblo Bonito was far from unique. Pasuingi, <laughs> spelled P-O-S-E. U-I-N-G-E, near present-day Ojo, O-J-O, Caliente, is another example among many, a complex of several adjoining three-story residential buildings. My Naga, we just talking about Naga architecture. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we know we got the masonry buildings already, right? Con, con, con. So this Posu, Pos, Posuinj, or Posi, contained more than 2,000 rooms. That's tribing up for real, for real. In the dry surrounding countryside, the people of this region, not only the ancient Hohokan, Hohokan, that means those that disappear. And we've been connecting the whole calm with the Tolte. I mean, you know, same people, my life, right? So, you know, we are those people they say disappear. Let's go. So the whole whole calm constructed intricate canals and ditches with diversion dams, floodgates, and other runoff control 
systems alongside which they planted gardens. So successful were these water management systems that as Peter Nabokov and Robert Easton have discovered, virtually all the water that fell in the immediate vicinity was channeled down spillways and troughs to feed their gardens and replenish their reservoirs. So that was just automatic. They didn't have to go, you know, uh, water their gardens. Managi. They had an irrigation system. <laughs> These intricate canals and ditches and diversion dams and floodgates and runoff control systems alongside which they planted gardens that were automatically fed by any water in the vicinity. Their reservoirs were replenished by default, my Naga. That's Naga irrigation, man. We're talking about Naga architecture. And in recent decades, aerial photography has revealed the presence of great ancient roadways up to 30 feet wide that linked the hundreds of Chaco Canyon communities with at least 50 so-called outlier population centers up to 100 miles away that's called tribing up my dog they, they were linked in with each other so it's like us being that joy world and then we linked in with other nagas that's on the other you know lands popping off ktc right <laughs> look out for us man that's tribe up communities man that's a tribe up nation popping off man that's tribe nation my dog that's 432 coming together. That's that MAM sauce. M H O E K T C. Most high over everything. A high five eyes. Ma, let's pop off, my night. Oh, we popping off, man. Hey, look out for us, man. So photography has revealed the presence of great ancient roadways up to 30 feet wide that linked the other hundreds of communities. Chaco communities with at least 50 so-called outlier population centers up to 100 miles away, each of which contain its own complex of large masonry pueblos. We just said we already had the masonry. We already got the drop. Even our garden got the automatic drop. Automatically, automatically getting fed. <laughs> automatically getting replenished. In all, it appears that these roads connected together communities spread out over more than 26,000 square miles of land, an area the size of Belgium and the Netherlands combined, although recent studies have begun to suggest that the Chaco region was even larger than the largest previous estimates have surmised. Indeed, as an indication of how much remains to be learned about these ancient peoples and societies in the Grand Canyon alone, more than 2,000 indigenous habitation sites. Say it again. Say it again, uh, David Stan. He said, in the Grand Canyon alone, more than 2,000 indigenous Naga <laughs> habitation sites have thus been identified. Of which only three have been excavated and studied intensively. Whoa. Remember that? We've been quoting this for a long time. And I just belly flopped, you know, I just happened to come across it. So 
At least now I know where it is. <laughs> I was like, where, where did I read that? Yeah, man. We're on page, what, 25 of the book American Holocaust by David Stanton. Okay, so we know where to find this drop in case anybody's wondering about what's in the Grand King. I mean, we, we saw the evidence with G.E. Kincaid and the, you know, all these uh, mummified situations, Egypt flow, you know what I'm saying? But what did they not reveal? You saw how much they're covering up Kalelu's, right? All the Hebrew artifacts. Do you think they'll let you know that a gang of Hebrew artifacts are being found in the Grand Canyon? Do you think any chance <laughs> exists of them telling you that? You see how they tripping on Kalelu's? The Smithsonian just, you know, throwing it underneath the rug, right? The Smithsonian, the Arizona State Museum just... Throwing it into the basement, huh? Do you think something as spectacular as a tour site as the Grand K that they'll let you know that Hebrew artifacts, even though you know that New Mexico's right there with the Lost Lunas Decalogue Stone, the Nine Code Commandments, Exodus 20's right there, in Paleo Hebrew in New Mexico. But do you think they'll let us know that this drop is, is existing right here in the Grand Canyon with the Grand Con? But what you do need to know is that in the Grand Canyon alone, more than 2,000 indigenous Habitation sites have thus far been identified, which means there's many, many more. Many, many more. And what is a habitation site anyway? A place that you live? <laughs> I mean, come on, man. I mean, what's the difference between a city and a habitation site? I'll wait. Is Los Angeles a habitation site? Is the Earth plane a habitation site? You know what I'm saying? So that's a very vague way of putting some type of, you know, city or location, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, <laughs> some type of territories. You could say you found 2,000 territories. I mean, you could say a lot of different things. But just know that 2,000 at least have been found from the indigenous Naga population. The copper color cons found here, con. Con. My Naga. You the indigenous. So if they found 2,000 habit, 2,000 hab, habitation sites and you're the indigenous. That means that what you perceive as a city, a city today ain't no city. What you perceive as a, as, oh, look at this county of this and whatever, third ward of that and all this principalities of this, man, you ain't in no city. <laughs> nah, man, you forgot about your cities, man. Your city's got your things in it. Your, your city's got your stuff. Where's your stuff? Where's your things? My Naga, this is back in the 20s. All right, they found 2,000 indigenous habitation sites. And out of that 2,000, only three have been excavated. How many today? We don't know. We don't know how many habitation sites, indigenous Nagas, you know what I'm saying, that they found bodies, bodies on bodies that they found. You think they're going to discuss Hebrew bodies with you? Hell no. Only three out of 2,000 habitation sites were even excavated. Man, what is out there? What is in there, right? 
only three out of 2,000, <laughs> while almost half of the canyon's 1,200,000 acres of land, almost half of that has never even been seen at close range by an archaeologist or a historian. Come on, man. We popping off the Amara Khan Holocaust. Wow. Oh, Anag, I said 1,200,000 acres of land has never even been seen at close range by an archaeologist or historian. And these are guesstimates, man. Despite the enormous amount of organized labor that was necessary to construct their carefully planned communities, the Nagas, the native people, of the Southwest have always been known for their political egalitarianism and their respect for personal autonomy. The earliest Spanish visitors to the Southwest. Uh oh. Hey, cities of go. Oh, 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 oh. We just talked about the uh, first non natives to enter Hawaku. We just talked about the first uh, African to step foot in the Amarukan homeland of Cibola. And what happened to Esteban Azamor? Azamor. Oh, little Stephen, little Saint Stephen. What happened to Stephen there, Christ? Esteban, child of the sun. He was martyred, right? He was a Christian martyr because he was rocking with the black Roman emperor. Uh, Charles V, Charles Kento, the black man. So these Spaniards are black. These Romans, even these hijacked Romans, are black. And they took their black, they <laughs> they black tail up in, you know, the promised land. And Esteban went missing because he brought weapons of death. He brought a 440 hijack frequency to uh, Kalelus. He was trying to steal their women. He was stealing their turquoises. Esteban going crazy. And then he told him that he was working for a white man. <laughs> they said, man, who sent you? He said, man, I, I work for a white man. He said, man, we don't believe your story, man. How is it possible that any of us could work for a white man? <laughs> so they put him to death. Because that shit was impossible. And they knew what we know now. That these swarthy blacks are ruling the world. And I say black as in wicked. Because that's what we going through. With our own brothers and cousins. More and more war. It was wickedness. It was covetousness. For longitude and latitude. For the Americas. The land of Shem. Shambhala, Cibola, Cibola, cities of gold. So they're talking about this. The earliest Spanish visitors, right? So we know who that is. <laughs> Esteban and them, let's go. They are black people, let's go. In the Southwest, including Francisco Vasquez de Coronado in 1540, and Diego Pierre Perez de Luxan, L U X X A N, in 1582, frequently commented on the widespread equality 
and codes of reciprocity they observed among such Pueblo people as the Hopi and the Zuni. Now, these, this is Israel. Because their code was something they commented about. The Zuni Cibola complex. Con, the Zuni Cibola. Say it with me. Zuni Cibola complex. Look it up. Look up the Zuni Cibola. S I B O L A complex. Cibola is going to take you to the cities of Gold Drop. Yo, they're saying they didn't find it. I'm saying they weren't in the right frequency to find it. All they found was scraps. All this stuff that Queen Elizabeth and all them got, all this gold that Europe got now, that's scrap metal compared to the cities of gold. <laughs> they got the scrap metal and they ran their empire off scraps. Thinking they rich. Printing out money that don't mean shit. They ran their empire on scraps. They never found the cities of gold, man. They found the cities of gold. They wouldn't even bother taxing Anaga at that point. You would know if they found the cities of gold. They'll be like, hey, man, fuck the taxes. We, we don't need taxes no more, y'all. Just forget it. We, we love everybody. And we out this piece. <laughs> they wouldn't even care. It'll be so much. They got scraps, man. They're fighting over scraps. So, Pete, the only significant class distinctions that could be discerned were those that granted power and prestige, but not excessive wealth to the most elderly women and men. Observing the descendants of these same people 400 years later, 20th century anthropologists continue to reach similar conclusions. It is, quote, fundamentally indecent. Anthropologist Clyde, Clyde Cluckhan once wrote of the Navajo, quote, for a single individual to make decisions for the group. That was far from the case. However, for the Indians of the Southwest or Southeast who were encountered by Hernando de Soto in the early 16th century during his trek through Florida in search of gold. Hear much more hierarchical or hierarchical political and personal arrangements prevail. At one location during his travels in the southeast, De Soto was met by the female leader of the Kafitaka. Kafita, I'm gonna spell it out. C O F I T A C H E Q U I. Woo! Kafitakeki. I think I think I got it. Kafita Keki <laughs> nation who's carried in a sedan, a sedan chair, S-E-D-A-N, sedan chair, was wrapped in long pearl necklaces. So back it up. You got a, a hey, shout out to my lady dragons on the wall. So the female leader of the Kafita Kaki Kui nation who was carried in a sedan chair, sedan chair. So she's carried in some beautiful chair and was wrapped in long pearl necklaces and rolled in a cushion field and awning covered boat. She commanded a large area of agriculturally productive land once settled with dense clusters of towns and filled with impressively constructed ceremonial and burial sites. And plundering those sites, De Soto, so they just plundered all this stuff. Right? She, she had all this impressive stuff, you know, impressive agriculturally productive land. You know what they did with that agriculturally productive land? That large area that this queen who's riding on this chair with long pearl necklaces. You know what they did to her agriculturally productive land? They just plundered it. They just plundered it, man. 
In plundering those sites, DeSoto's men found elegantly carved chest and art objects. <laughs> they, they just thieves, just thieving shit. They thieving everything. I mean, at, at some point, we gotta be like, the hell? Steal, 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 kill, kill, kill. What happened to thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal? Nah, nah, not when it comes to your land. Not when it comes to your land. Not when it comes to your land. They break all the rules. That's why they got to come up out of it. They got too greedy. They just started breaking all the rules recklessly. Even if a while was putting his children through a discipline period. They got reckless. <laughs> they were very reckless. You know what I'm saying? And uh, still, still, still. Kill, kill, kill. Now it's time to chill, chill, chill. Now it's time for them to fall back. Ain't no more still, 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 kill, kill, kill. This is the very end of their empire. American Hulk. In plundering those sites, DeSoto's men found elegantly carved chest and art objects, pearl inlaid and copper tipped weapons other valuables including as many as 50,000 bows and quivers that at least one of the conquistadors compared favorably with anything he had seen in fabulously prosperous Mexico or Peru so he said man what I just found you know what I'm saying right uh <laughs> you know from the from the treasures of this of this priest queen, this fe this female leader, this 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 beautiful aqua dracon popping off on the wall, riding with her long pearl necklaces and cushion field and awning covered boat, her large area that she commanded of agriculturally productive land that once settled with dense clusters of towns filled with impressively constructed ceremonial and burial sites. She had it all. Everything was in order. Kind of sounds like a, like a Sheba Khalifa flow, right? In plundering those sites, they found all her stuff, her carved chest, art objects, pearl inlaid and copper tipped weapons and other valuables, 50,000 bows and quivers, so these conquistadors said, man, this is better than anything we even saw in Mexico and Peru. And they right here in North America, right? Or India Superior. Finding superior stuff. Superior things. It was an apt comparison, not only because the jewelry and pottery from this area is distinctly similar in many respects to that of Mesoamerica and the Andes, but because large and dense city-like settlements built in stockade fashion and surrounded by intensely uh, cultivated agricultural plantations were common here. So whatever she had, like you saw it all the time. And it's interesting that they have a correlation between Mesoamerica, the Andes, and this whole uh, Southeast or Southwest, you know what I'm saying, situation happening in America. So, you know, not only is it favorable based on what they're finding, but there's, you know, a comparison with these Andes, right? Maybe it's all one thing, you know? Maybe, um, you know, I always envision Vortexes. You know, I, I always envision Godzilla, you know what I'm saying? King Kong, Antarctica. I envision that type of stuff. You know, when I think about the giant trees, the silica trees, you know what I mean? The crystal trees reaching the firmament and how deep their roots must have went. And that these caves and cavernous areas underground, right? <laughs> are just the roots of, of mama. You know, it's, it's, it's like the artery. You know what I'm saying? Of mama, the, the roots of the tree are like the arteries. You know what I'm saying? 
and they're just the roots of these giant crystal trees that once reached the, the heavens, right? So imagine Mount Roraima. That's just a tree stump, man. Look at all those trees around these Tapui situations, right? So imagine how deep the tree roots go. Wow. And can you connect or does, do these tree roots connect underground from here to Peru, you know, to Brazil, to yada, yada, yada. Like, can you travel in the roots of these giant trees from place to place? It was an apt comparison, not only because the jewelry and pottery from this area is distinctly similar. So the same type of jewelry is right here, you know, in so-called North America. And then they got in, in the Andes and what they call Mesoamerica. But because large, dense-like settlements built in stockade fashion and surrounded by intensely cultivated agricultural plantations were common here, as were state and quasi-state organizations in the political realm. Major cultural centers here include those of the Cado, C-A-D-D-O. And then, you know, that's another one we got to dig on because that connects. I forgot exactly what that connected to, but I remember that connected <laughs> to something major. The C-A-D-D-O people. The Hasanai, H-A-S-I-N-A-I. The Bidai, B-I-D-A-I. The Atacapa, A-T-A-K-A-P-A, and the Tunica, T-U-N-I-C-A, the Chickasaw, the Tuskegee, the Natchez, the Homa, H-O-U-M-A, the Choctaw, the Creek, the Tahome, the Pensacola, the Appalachie, the Seminole, the Seminole, uh, the Yamasi, the, Kas the Kusabo, the Wakama, <laughs> the Kataba, and the Wakon, W-O-C-C-O-N, and again, as in many regions, many more. So these were the cultural centers. Now you put that together with the Kum say, you know, how he was uniting these tribes. You know, he went to all these tribes, you know what I'm saying, to the Kataba, to the Creek, to the Chickasaw, to the Choctaw, right? So, you know, put this together with the biblical story, you know what I'm saying? And we start to see clearly and get the babies out the bath water. That when we talk tribal and tribal unity, that's something that we've been trying to accomplish, man. But you keep having these treaties, these backdoor treaties, man. And you realize, man, they don't want to unify. They just want it to be something that they can control. These tribes will never unify. They just want to control. You think we can ever unify with Moab? <laughs> I mean, some of them, some of them, you know, some going to choose up. But, you know, you know, overall, they're going to think their power is the greatest, right? Overall, they're going to think they deserve to be in your spot. They deserve to be on your land. And that's just what we deal with. When we deal with, uh, you know, the family history, man. But this is a tribe, this is a vibe, and this is a family. And this is what we're digging on. Not to disgrace nobody and nothing like that. But if you disgrace by your own, uh, you know, by the path that your ancestors have taken, then that's something that you got to correct now. Because what you do now affects them, even if you think it's in the past. What you do now affects your ancestors. Past, present, future, all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? So nothing is so solid that, you know, it doesn't change or vibe up. You know, the vibe that we're putting out is being felt by our ancestors of the so-called past and the future real ones. Monaga. So, yeah, it's our time. <laughs> Last part is this for the disma. No other part of North America outside of Mesoamerica has such complex and differentiated societies or tribes and no other area outside the Northwest Coast and California was so linguistically diverse, 
much more diverse, in fact, than Western Europe is today. <laughs> you got to get this through your head, bone. You're talking the old world, man. Linguistically, we have so many languages, especially with the Babel situation, right? <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, and, and you think of Western Europe today as super diverse linguistically, but it had nothing on Mesoamerica, North America, or India. Say it with me. Superior. Let's go. Pottery developed in this region at least 4,000 years ago, and true agriculture followed about 1,000 years later, although the, the people of the southeast did hunt and fish. They lived primarily in sedentary communities. Distinguished by clusters and towering temple mounds, large public buildings that each held scores and sometimes hundreds of assigned seats for political and religious gatherings. The assemblages and assemblages of individual family houses that spread over as many as 15 to 20 miles. The people lived in these state-like communities largely with were nourished by enormous fields of corn, beans. <laughs> I love the brother nature. We got corn and beans, man. That's all we need, man. We popping off, man. And other produce that they harvested in two or even three crops each year and stored in corn cribs and granaries. They were superb basket makers, carpenters, potters, weavers, tanners, fishermen. Some like the Calusa fished from large canoes in the open ocean, while they and others also gathered clams and oysters from the coast and used wares and basket traps and spears and stupefying herbs to catch fish in rivers and in streams. The Calusa, in fact, are especially intricately or intriguing to that in that they defy conventional rules of political anthropology by having been a complex of hunting, fishing, and gathering societies that also were sedentary and highly stratified with political power and centralized government. Paramount chiefs who commanded standing armies of warriors who had no other work obligations ruled directly over dozens of towns in their district while controlling Dozens more through systems of tribute, class rankings, including included notes, commoners and servants who were military captives, while there were specialized roles for wood carvers, painters, engravers, navigators, healers, and scores of dancers and singers who performed on ceremonial occasions. And such festivities were both frequent and major affairs. One European account from the 16th century describes a paramount chief's house as large enough to accommodate 2,000 people. That's how that Naga living, <laughs> without being very crowded. <laughs> Moreover, such buildings were not especially large by southeastern coast standards. As J. Leach White or Wright Jr. notes, Quote, similar structures in Appalachia, Tamuka, Tamukua, and Goal, G-U-A-L, that's in coastal Georgia, held considerably more. Elaborate social and cultural characteristics of this nature are not supposed to exist among non-agricultural and non-industrial people. But like many of the hunting and gathering societies of the Northwest, the Calusa lived in an environment so rich in easily accessible natural resources that agriculture was not needed to maintain large, stable, political, complex settlements. One measure of the great size of these communities can be seen in the middens. The refuse collections studied by archaeologists that the Calusa left behind. Hmm. So, all right. Maybe that's some drop, man. It says one measure of the great size of these communities can be seen in the middens, which is spelled M-I-D-D-E-N-S. So look that up. Uh, it says the refused collection studied by 
archaeologists, the refused collection study by archaeologists that the Calusa left behind. Might be some drop throughout the world among the large shellfish middens known to exist are those at Erbole in Denmark, E R T E B O L L E, in Denmark, where they range up to 30 acres in size. Damn, that's a big, that's a big situation. It says throughout the world among the largest shellfish middens, M I D D E N S E N S, known to exist are those at your bell denmark where they range up to 30 acres in size and almost 10 feet in height in comparison shell middens from calusa areas throughout southwest florida have been found covering up to 80 acres of land and reaching to heights of 20 feet that is many times the cubic volume of the largest your bell middens and yet the enormous Enormous as these deposits are testifying to extraordinary concentrations of population, ethno-historical and archaeological evidence indicates that shellfish were not a major component of the Calusa diet. I mean, we're just talking <laughs> the Marocan Holocaust, man, and we've been able to get a a great picture, you know, thus far. Together, we, you know, we, we've been side by side to repaint the picture of what they call history. To imagine some of the stuff I'm reading, it's just like them, you know, when they were trying to imagine where they were when they were seeing these things. And they said, maybe we're in Atlantis. Maybe we're just in a dream. I mean, all this is their quotes. Their conquistadors saying, yeah, my soldiers thought they were dreaming. We saw towers coming out the water. <laughs> we saw stuff we weren't supposed to see. This is why they had to take your sight away. So that you cannot see. And that you cannot come back to Hawaii to KTC. But when you do, it's one try, one vibe, and what comes with it immediately, what comes with being KTC immediately, all praise Hawaii, we going to keep the code and we going to get our land back. So we're talking the land, the flow, you know what I'm saying? We're talking what's here, you know, and, uh, you know, what to expect, my dog, because, you know, ain't nothing new, right? Whatever they say is coming. Ain't nothing new, my life. You came here for a very specific purpose at a very specific time. And I'm grateful to, you know, share this wave with you, my Naga, to share this wave with real ones that can truly feel this. You know what I'm saying? They have to readjust their whole flow. The average so-called black man and woman got to readjust their whole flow so that they can know that there's a code worth keeping and that we will not be broke. We will not be broke. So continue to come. Quam or not. Keep rising. And as we dig on the American Holocaust to see what happened, we can meditate, man, on, you know, being in code and order so that it never happens again. The Wada for vibing up, tribing up, and rising up.